Hey everyone, welcome to Voluntary Virtues. I'm Mike Shanklin. Today I'm joined again with Daniel Rothschild. I have him. I try to have him at least once a week. He, uh, I think our discussions are pretty insightful, at least for me, and I hope for him uh, whenever we get together. And so we just want to record it and allow everybody else to listen to us. We have a couple different topics. First of all, how you doing, uh, Banker? I'm, I'm good. Great, great to see you. I'm I'm so glad to be on your show and pour my brilliance. You're oh, you're smart, yeah. but I'm come on. Not well, kidding. you're you're, you're rough. You're, I mean, look at all your wealth from your banking family. It's, oh, it's, yeah, right. I, I mean, if you can problem. control statism that well, this inefficient monopoly, I, I'm, I, I mean, kudos to you. Yeah. Anyway, I have, no, I have a nice la – you know, I was at a bank actually and um, making a checkout, and, the, and I, it was in a foreign country, and the woman had a look at my passport, and she said, oh, Rothschild, do you have a girlfriend? And I said, no, and she's like, I'm kidding. I'm like, I'm not. <laughs> I thought you were going to say something else after that. That's funny. Uh, so, yeah, I'm sure you've used that a couple times uh, within the last few years. As this, you, have to, uh, yeah. you have to use, you know, if you got it, flaunt it. Yeah, that's right. All but right, so <laughs> well, let's look at the topics for today. We're going to be talking about Hollywood hypocrites and statism, the trolley car experiment. I think you're, these are topics that Rothschild brought to me, and I think they were great. We've got to talk about all this stuff. But you were, when I see the trolley car experiment, are you talking about the Harvard professor? Yeah. John something, yeah. Okay. I know his name. Yeah, I know who you're talking about, though. Yes. Uh, yeah. All right, and uh, Republicans in smaller government. How to stop the government oppressing you so much? Is there anything you can do, actually? Oh, and other countries are much worse, so stop your bitching. That's a quote. Not from us. We're going to talk about that. That phrase <laughs> itself. Uh, and there's one more here. Oh, yeah, the will of the people and acting in society's interest. What does that mean? And the conflict inherent in government. So really good topics, Rothschild. I'm glad you brought this to us. So let's start with the Hollywood hypocrites and statism. Obviously, we're, you're talking mostly about a liberal elite here, not that you have a conservative or Republican bend, but that you obviously are just, we're just focusing on one of the pro parts of the problem right now. We'll, we'll look at the elite liberals right now. I want you to – why did you bring this topic up today about Hollywood hypocrites and how uh, statism interlaces? Well, you know, I heard a quote. I think it was one of the common, uh, one of the fans of the Facebook page. He didn't originate it, but I heard it from him, uh, which is um, Washington D.C. is Hollywood for ugly people, which I think is a very accurate uh, assessment. I mean, look, I, I, for most part, not everyone in Hollywood, but for most part, people in Hollywood are incredibly. It's hard to blame them because. When you when you enter the you're lionized. You walk down the street and people take pictures of you. Your handwriting people treasure. So you know it's hard to blame that these these people for being so narcissistic. Um, but you know it's filled with some of the most self righteous narcissistic um, people who live some of the most va lavish uh, love lifestyles um, ever. Um, there was uh, an interview where, where Mike Myers uh, was helping protesting on the Occupy Wall Street, and he was criticizing uh, uh, wealth inequality. Mike Myers, who was actually known for being quite high maintenance and wanting only and wanting to remove one of the colors of the M and M's when you serve it to him. So a guy talking about wealth inequality to be so particular about his M and M colors. Um, or people of all these homes talking about wealth inequality. You know, Russell Brandt talked about wealth inequality, and he has uh, what, fourteen million dollars. Um, so you know, it's it's it, it's again, you know, the uh, the anti uh, Leo Tolstoy quote: "Everyone thinks of changing the world; no one thinks of changing himself." It's really about you know, I'm an actor. People admire my brilliance, and I don't have to live by examples. I mean, the divorce rate in Hollywood is probably over 50%, way over 50%, extremely high compared to most professions, the entertainment industry. So do we really need to be lectured by these rich, narcissistic, self-righteous hypocrites on how, on how we have to manage our own relationships when theirs typically fall apart, when they themselves, you know, if... if, if if someone walked over to them and said hello, would they treat them nicer with respect, or would they just walk down the street? You know, and a lot of them even charge for autographs. So this idea that they that they care about the poor, it's just it's just again, you know, wanting a pat on the back. And I think this is this relates, of course, I think very well to statism that you know you believe that 
because you're rich and famous, you know, your your opinion matters and that you're great and you don't have to self-improve. You could just tell other people what to do and why, you know, and that to me is a, a typical quality in human nature. Everyone sucks but me. Yeah, and I think it comes back to living uh, the actions that you believe. So in other words, you know, I think the voluntarist mantra really has become try to to live the way that you're preaching, right? I mean, don't just talk the talk, walk the walk. And I think one of the things that we notice from so many liberal elites, uh, especially the ones who demonize money, who are so brainwashed into this leftism of anti-property, anti-money, money's the problem. Uh, if we just politics is the good thing. And how many of them money do out of ads? Politics. How many of them do that do ads for diamonds and perfumes? Right. And come on. Well, and not, yeah, and not, and not only that, uh, you know, they have all this money, and then they act like everybody else should be given to charity. Uh, when they have like a, a hundred and fifty thousand times more money than I have, and I'd probably, uh, I feel like I'm, I'm doing charity work all my life <laughs> in this profession, but uh, at least educationally. But you know, I don't see them really even taking two seconds to examine the system. Then they act like they've they're so well researched on it and stuff like that. It's just, it makes me sick, and this is why people like Bono actually give me some some optimism. Because for years he was just ranting against free markets and capitalism, and then, you know, 30 years later he finally saw the way. He finally understands uh, that that individuals should, left in their own autonomy in some manner, or, or what he believes is capitalism is probably a form of anarchy. But he's obviously come a long way, and he he understands more and more every day that individuals being free outside of government regulations is what actually builds prosperity and peace. So. Uh, it, it, it is uh, out there. Obviously, it's been around for a very long time, and I think it's going to be stuck for us for a while. And I think it's because they statism is itself a dream world, right? It's a fantasy world. Statism is a fantasy world that these adults around us haven't matured enough to grow out of. And so when you have these other people who are going to be making a lot of money to make up dreams and dream worlds and uh, worlds that you can live in that aren't reality, uh, people who are already... Uh, or live outside of reality are going to flock towards that naturally. And so they just have a natural following of people who live outside of reality or who like to think outside. And not that I'm, I don't want to, to squash imagination, right, or have force people into a box, but at the same time, that's really what they're doing is, is capitalizing off of other people's um, attachment to some form of, you know, disreality, and they can't really see how they've been suckered by these capitalists, and sometimes they do produce a good product, so this comes back to the subjective theory of value. It's not like, I'm going to ban movies because they, they're all bad and horrible. And That's not true at all. I like some movies. You know, I, I enjoy movies, I, and, and they mean something different to everybody else, but at the same time, that's what they're really doing. They're making money, uh, and doing quite well, I might add, uh, at within their movies, because most of their movies aren't really that heavily you know, uh, political in most cases, right? They, they usually... Maybe the natural statism that's all around us any day that most people just naturally fall into. But it's not like they're out uh, in the movies. It's not like Jim Carrey ever in Ace Ventura said, oh, we should ban guns, right? I mean, th th they do good on their own, and that's why they have the wealth is because they're actually producing something that other people who all might value might be subjective. They still do value it more than, you know, this is what consumer and producer surplus comes back to in this case. They're they're paying less than what they value the video for. They wouldn't have bought the video in the first place or, you know, rented it or whatever you want to call it, gone to the movie theater. So my point is they don't, they don't even live by their own actions uh, in the fact that they keep telling other people that they need to be more charitable. Um, but then at the same time, most of them have all of this wealth still that they haven't oh, given up, so I don't think they're leading by example. Anything else you, you want to add? You know, it's interesting. In the 1950s, in Hollywood, there was something known as the House for uh, Un American Activities Committee, which basically, um, if people suspected you of being a communist, you were blacklisted from Hollywood. Now, if you're not a communist, yeah. you're blacklisted uh, from Hollywood. Um, People get criticized for this all the time. Justin Bieber uh, spoke out against the minimum wage. He was criticized for this. Kelly Clarkson wrote a tweet saying, vote for Ron Paul. Uh, she was criticized heavily for this. Um, Stacey Dash, uh, uh, the, the, a girl, the black girl from a Clueless, uh, said, vote for Romney. Uh, and she received a lot of death th threats uh, from this. Um, Kevin Sorbo has mentioned that you know he, he he people have said to him that that uh, he got turned down movie roles because of his beliefs 
Um, now, Kevin Sorbo is very ballsy. He, you know, he goes to people like George Clooney and he says, you can afford to be a socialist, you're rich. But, um, which, you know, takes guts. But, you know, I mean, look, not everyone uh, can be P Penn Jillette, you know, or Teller. You know, the few people, I don't know if they're really considered Hollywood, but, you know, at least, you know, those are people with morals and, you know, stable marriages uh, and um, are nice people in real life who say hello to their fans after the show. Uh, so at least, you know, they're living uh, their views. Yeah, and it's so funny, that all this talk about diversity from people who are who are technically anti-diversity. Not that I'm anti-diversity. I like people. Diversity, you know, I, I, they mean external well, diversity, superficial. Diversity right. is not diversity of thought. It's different color skin, different body parts, who you want to have sex with. It's only what you see on the surface. The, right. the external diversity, because their philosophy is so shallow, there's nothing to it. All The only thing, to them, diversity is different color liberals. Right, right. And, um, and, and, and you know, here's the new joke. There was one that was like conservative liberal based. Well, I made it, I, I kind of twisted it around this quote. And I basically said, the next time uh, a university president, conservative or liberal, talks about diversity at his school, ask him how many voluntarist professors he has. <laughs> you know yes. what I'm saying? Because yeah. probably Thomas Sowell said a similar thing about, about uh, ask how many Republicans there are in the sociology department, right? Right, right. Yeah, that yeah. was the same one, yeah. And, and, and that's a good point in itself. Uh, not that the Republicans are right, but, you know. The, the, my, my thing is most Republicans wouldn't do sociology because then they would have to, all of their social, you know, fascist issues would go out the door <laughs> once they understand human interaction. So anyway, um, no, good stuff. we got to move on. I want to go to the trolley car experiment and why utilitarianism fails, obviously, for those uh, who, who don't know, let me let me kind of summarize this. There's a professor from Harvard University. You can actually find the video online. I think you just type in trolley and Harvard and click the video button on Google, and you should be able to find this trolley car experiment. And it was basically asking the question, you're on a track. At first, uh, you're, you're on a track. Or I think, at, at, yeah, at first, you're on the track and you're driving this train, and the brakes go out, and there's, there's people. You can see there's construction workers down the road, there's like five of them, uh, but then you can also see how there's the the the, tr the cart or not the cart the track actually veers off to the right, but there's only one guy at the end of that track, and you have the you're behind the wheel and there's no brakes, so you're either going to plow into five people or one people would you turn the steering wheel of the train and steer it into the one person or the five, then he takes it. The next step after asking that question and getting some discussion on that, they take it the next step and say, well now you're outside of the trolley, and uh, you, you you can basically push this fat man that's next to you on this trolley off of the off of the trolley, uh, or excuse me, off of the edge of the trolley where you actually enter into the trolley. So he'll fall, stopping the trolley before it hits the five guys. Would you do that? Because then that would actually you have you have the the question of is this one person's life worth stopping this train to get all these other people? So he went through these uh, different scenarios, and Rothschild wanted to talk about it, and I'm, I'll add my two cents afterwards. Sure. Um, and I, I got to check on Bryson, so you blab, and I'll be right back. All right, no problem. I can do that. Um, yeah, the the basic gist of the trolley car experiment is do nothing, and that results in the death of of uh, five people. Do something actively, and that results in the death of only one. So the the whole point of the experiment is: would you murder uh, one person or or uh, just a few people to save many lives? Real, it's really just a justification for a genocide. Uh, better to kill a million people, if it's better to kill one to save ten, then it's better to kill a million to save uh, thirteen million, right? This is, no, you know, you know, let me ask Hitler you a question. Hitler had a similar ideology. I In fact, he did here. have a similar ideology because um, one of the things he said is, he, you know, the Germans had something called life unworthy of life. Okay. And where these people, where he said, certain people have a disease. And if someone has a disease and they, uh, and they uh, marry someone else and have kids, they are spreading diseases to other people. So in order to stop people from spreading these diseases, we have to just, to, in order to save all these people, we have to either prevent these people from um, spreading their diseases or we have to kill them. Originally, Hitler didn't even want to just kill all these people. He originally wanted them to go to another country, but only later he decided to do that. He was actually influenced by the euthanasia, by the... Um, by the uh, by the um, crap. What's it called? The um, 
What is it? It starts with an E. I'm blanking out on the name. Were you... Eugenics? Eugenics, sorry, right. He was influenced by the uh, eugenics movement uh, in the United States, started, I think, by President Wilson. Uh, uh, He called him the great American savior in Mein Kampf. Uh, And so he was influenced by that, you know, the the progressive uh, eugenic movement to do that. But basically, the whole point is, you know, murdering one to save five is a justifiable. And the utilitarians say uh, one is not as great as five, uh, if we value life, we have to save the most amount of lives as possible. The problem with this argument let's, is even according to utilitarian logic, the argument fails. Because we're inter- you know, it's, it's that old quote, penny wise but a pound foolish. You know, um, I could charge a million dollars for a car, but if I charge a thousand, I might be making less on each car, but overall I'm making greater profits. So, uh, it's about maximizing not just life now, but maximizing life ever. And the future um, is uh, uncertain. We don't know anything about these guys in this theoretical example. I mean, maybe, you know, the five people you save, them or their future progeny down the line, is going to turn out to be a mass murderer who will destroy thousands of lives. So you're... So you're not actually saving anyone, and the person who you kill, maybe him or one of his future progeny down the line, uh, will invent a disease that will save a thousand lives. So it's only in the moment saving one to save five. You don't know what the future is down the road. This is just irrational, short-term, I'm in a bad situation, let me just do something emotionally without thinking about the long-term repercussions. And this is very indicative of the policies that that these people implement. Um, in order to save one person, to save five, I'm going to have an FDA uh, to do drug testing because, after all, if we don't do it, then people don't know if the drugs are safe and they'll die. But, of course, what ends up happening uh, is all these people who need life-saving drugs don't get to them and they die because they're not able to take these drugs. So it's really just a short, very short-term approach. Uh, well, let, me ask you a question. That, let me ask you a question. So let's say that... Uh, I want you to respond to this. I'm just playing devil's advocate with for you for with you for Go a ahead. Let's say that I say, well, the utilitarian approach is that since we are all autonomous individuals, we should have property rights over ourselves and our justly acquired property, and that will improve the world for everyone. I want you to respond to that. What people should have the right to their justly acquired yeah the, the utilitarian argument of property rights being good. I mean, I don't. I mean, I sort of agree with the end, so I don't really care what their argument is. Um, well, the but, argument is the argument is we can either have collective ownership of, of the resources, or we can have individuals owning property and and subsequently having choice. And the utilitarian argument in this case actually goes along with the non-moral relativist position or the actual ethical benchmark, which is the non-aggression principle, stating that when we adhere to the NAP then we will all be better off, we'll all be much more prosperous, much more peaceful. Mm-hmm. That is actually a utilitarian argument in and of itself, is it not? Sure, it is. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, no, Ludwig von Mises okay. was utilitarian. He believed very strongly in property rights. Right, right. well, he was also he also took st- stuff a priori, too. So he was a mixture, in my opinion. So yes. well, I, get, I, get the, I get the impression of both from him. But he did have his consequential side, too. Yeah, I mean, obviously. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, a utilitarian side. So... I, I, now I want to take it the next step. Let's we've been we've been automatically associating utilitarianism with statism. What about we look outside of statism for a second? Would it? It seems like every time we have a choice, we're using some type because of scarcity and we have a, a lack of perfect information that we have to use utilitarianism to come to some rational conclusions. Sure, I might be able to use this one pencil right now, uh, and it might actually save me money over the ink for the one day, but once I start you know, going through the pencil and it gets down to the end and then I have to get a new pencil, uh, and then I, I look at that bulk pricing of pens, well, it ends up costing me more in the end. Uh, I don't know exactly what I will be doing, how long I'll be doing pencils, but my chances are I'll be doing it for so and so long, so the utilitarian argument in this case would be, although the pencil might have been cheaper in the short term, once I look at the pricing in the long term, it actually turns out the pens are cheaper, that's a utilitarian argument, is it not? Sure. 
But that's you're deciding this for yourself. You're not deciding. Okay. Well, that's see. I don't want to attack utilitarianism outright. It can have its negative sides. I think is what I'm trying to say. I agree sure. with you. Obviously, when anything in statism is is bad, right? It, but um, I'm just saying that you know, utilitarianism itself has can't does some good for right. society and our individual well, choices. But if you may, you you everyone should be able to decide for themselves how how you know do I want to buy something more expensive. That's a car that's more expensive but safer. Do I not? People should be able to choose these things for themselves. You know. So yes, you know, if there's nothing wrong with choosing, uh, using utilitarian for your own choices, um, but uh, it's different when it comes to deciding for other people. Right. No, I'm with you. All right, let's move on. Good stuff. So uh, let's, we can kind of segue this into Republicans and smaller government. <laughs> All right, sorry, I had to laugh there for a second. Republicans and smaller government. That's so funny. All right, so we have uh, a, a bunch of Republicans calling for smaller government, the same people who did bailouts and TARP. And, I mean, I just name a government program, and they probably had some play in it. What, what, what did you want to bring? What, I mean, we, we, we pretty much know that the Republicans, uh, the whole smaller government mantra is just something to get fools to believe sure. that they're going to become freer somehow through voting for those crooks. So what's your, what, why'd you bring this up? I want to hear your two cents. Well, basically that, you know, I mean, yes, I don't think anyone on the show doesn't know that Republicans are not for, for smaller government. Um, in fact, often um, government often increases more under Republican leadership uh, in many Especially instances. debt, yeah, ironic enough, yep. Well, sure. Because they cut spending. Yeah. They cut spending. Or they cut. They cut taxes, but they don't cut spending. And so that the right. you know this has to. It's just a a, a, a short term fallacy to be like, oh my gosh, they cut taxes four percent. Thank you, Senator so and so. Bend over and let me. You know, I'll bend over for you now. Yeah. It's just kind of like, gosh, you're so weak minded. You know, <laughs> like you really fell for that. You know, this guy's just charged it all into your grandkids. Don't you get it? Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. No, I I I, I agree with that. So, you know, I mean, look, it's sort of laughable. I think when you go to these um, uh, Republicans, I, I think it's very easy to say to them, you know, how is, you know, the drug war limited government? How is, uh, you know, legalizing prostitution? Uh, Marriage? Is... Any of the government's business? Marriage? Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. No, I'm with you. I'm Yeah, I mean, I've, I don't even think we have to go on. It's almost like insulting to the viewers that we have to continue on with this discussion. But we do have to clarify that, and I'm glad you brought it up, because people do need to realize our position on the Republicans. We state this number, numerous times over on the Facebook page, Today is Miss Slavery, that this has got to be a joke. You think Republicans are there for freedom. They're there for rulership systems and forced hierarchy and anti proprietarian belief systems. They are so statist, communistic, and fascist in their own mindsets. It's, uh, it's, it's almost scary how most people can't just naturally see that, right? I didn't see it for years. I just it, I didn't really you understand much politics. I was a kid, right? And nobody ever educated me on it. So sure. I had to go out into the real world and do the hard work myself, unlike most people who are double my age, which is really disappointing. Anyway, let's get on to the topic of how to stop the government oppressing you so much. Is there anything we can do to stop the trillions of hours of peaceful people that are being thrown in cages, the hundreds of thousands of innocent children, men and women, innocent, that are being blown up and destroyed, chunks and body parts flying everywhere? Is there any way to stop? the incremental taxation increases that we've seen that have now been sixfold over the last 105 years in this so-called greatest, freest country. Is there anything to do to stop the suppression, Rothschild? Please, please give me some optimistic information. I'd love to hear it. Ha! You, you, you want optimism and you expect it coming from me. Um, yeah. I, I really don't know. How, I wanted to open this up more as a discussion. I don't really know the answer to that question. Unfortunately. Okay, here's, um, my, here's my only solution that I have so far. I can really su quickly summarize this. I think it's going to take one large area coming together. I'm talking uh, like uh, 15,000 to 100,000 voluntarists, which we will have that sometime soon. In fact, we have it now, I think. And coming together into one area and saying, we're not going to have a rulership system. We're going to do this. Nobody has the right to steal from anybody else. Once you cut off the theft... The theft really is what does it all because then they can spin the theft to brainwash your grandparents into it and crap like that, right? So <laughs> if you cut off the theft and the, th and, the, and, the, and the slavery right off the bat, I think the rest of it just melts away, especially when you already have the people who well, already I, may, I might think, have, have I, the mindset. I think in a country of 300 million people, 100,000 dissenters, 
uh, small potatoes. It's, I'm not talking about the central. I'm not saying we're going to stand up to the U.S. government and all this bullshit. No, we're going to move to somewhere else in some other region uh, that maybe we can actually break away from, maybe Honduras. I don't know. This is going to be 10, 15 years down the road. Okay. Maybe Gulf Gulf. It's not stopping government oppression. No. That's just running away. Well, uh, that's stopping oppression from you. Yes, actually it is. You tell me you're more oppressed here or in North Korea, man. If you believe that, you can be as just as free in any state. Go ahead. But the deal, the deal is you can be less oppressed by moving. It is sure. true. You, you, know? sure, you can, but I mean, look, I, I, that's not that's not a great solution. Uh, look, I mean, if, if a bully is There's no up, other solution. You're lying to yourself if you think that. If, you, if a child is picking – if a bully is picking on your child at school, is the solution to move them to a different school? You're free to make that choice, but that's not really a great way to solve the problem. You can stop the bullying. That's not a problem. No, you can stop that bullying through various tasks, most likely that night, calling up their parents, maybe even pressing a lawsuit. I mean, you can stop that right then, even in a free society. But you can't stop. Statism with all these brainwashed fools around you just pointing guns at you. They're just flailing guns everywhere, right? That's what the state right. is. It's just guns everywhere. I mean, everybody's breaking three felonies a day, supposedly, just because they have these millions of laws that most of these politicians and lobbyists get paid lots of buku bucks to write up in other people's favor, right? Not in favor of everybody under universal ethics. This is all bull crap. Okay. So you, you know where I'm getting at here. You ain't going to stop this system, but you can stop the bully. But my point is... Well, what other option is there? I think you're lying to yourself if you say you're going to be able to stop uh, statism inside of the U.S. within the next 15 years or anything. I agree with that. I, I agree. I you never might be able to move to New Hampshire. See, it's, it's I never made such insane claims. I agree with that. Okay, well, uh, what, you're, but what you're saying is I think I, I can change the environment on which I'm in when I'm stuck in a uh, torturer's basement. It's like, you know, I think if I just change the, the wallpaper on this torturer's basement's wall, things will be a lot cheerier and happier and I'll be less depressed. I don't, the guy's still going to torture you in the morning, man. Get the f out of that house. At least it's unlocked somewhat. So, that, you know, this is kind of what I'm saying. Um, I don't think there's any other way to stop the oppression other than try to maybe change your appearance to be much more mainstream and generic. Uh, if I mean, who, who gets fucked with the most by the cops? and stop and frisks and all that stuff. It's people who look like gangsters and thugs. And that's who, uh, I'm just saying this is the reality of the world, right? I mean, it's minorities who, who end up getting hit by that. And so, the, the, they, but they continue to wear the same clothing. Not that they should be feeling like they have to change or anything, like that, but you are oppressed, right? You're oppressed. So as long as you wear that stuff, uh, it's kind of like an act of civil disobedience to the police officers. That's the way they see it. Uh, how, how dare you not conform to my thing where you have to have your pants uh, you know, uh, uh, up to your waist or whatever. Not, not that I, I favor one way or another. I could care less about people's clothing. It's such a silly detail thing when there's people dying and all this other stuff and theft everywhere. It's just such a stupid thing to talk about. But you know what I'm getting at here. It's these people that are stuck in this mentality. You're not going to change any of this, man. So, uh, th th but th this kind of leads us into, segues us to this next part, which is the, the statement that we wanted to reply to, and especially you, I'm sure. Other countries are much worse, so stop your bitching. Uh, in some cases, I want to... I want to put my two cents on this first, then we can move forward. America uh, has come really far down the road of totalitarianism within the last 20, 50 years. I mean, maybe even we could count 100. And, I mean, really far, really far. But it also had a pretty decent start, compared relative to everyone. Sure, there was slavery. Sure, they had constitutions which enabled theft and uh, supposedly limited regulations to general commerce, which is goddamn everything, right? <laughs> Thanks for limiting us to all that, to the limiting government to everything constitution. Anyway, well, I mean, what, what a what a douchebag piece of paper. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's the reality of the world, right? Um, but it, it, still, we had this a pretty good head start, right? There was so, some property rights. I mean, there are some regions you look at, and they are still decimated, it's like they, that's, a, that's why they're called the underdeveloped world. They haven't developed ever. Like they've never developed. Well, America does have a booming economy. The problem is as this economic freedom brought about all this peace and prosperity and it brought about parasites called politicians and lobbyists. They suck onto the system like vampires, leech off of it, off of, off of us and our unborn grandkids and drain the hell out of it, right? And and this is what's happened. We had so much freedom, and now it's going away. I want to hear your two cents. I've got a train coming anyway. Yeah, uh, two things. One, one of the reasons, I would argue, that this country is not as bad and oppressive relative to other countries is because people are not stopping their bitching. It's because people are saying, what the hell? 
and are fighting and are not just letting themselves be railroaded. So if we stop our bitching, <laughs> we're going to have way fewer uh, freedoms. So one of the reasons I would argue that this country, relative to uh, most other countries, is because in a lot of other countries, they don't bitch, and they do just take it. Uh, so it is due to our bitching that allows uh, us to be relatively uh, free. Yeah, if you're not bitching, you're not really supporting freedom. End of story. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. the end of the story. If you're not bitching, you're a little bitch. Yeah. <laughs> Pardon the French. Right. No, but, um, um, well, it's English. Stop being the French. But, right. And an, another thing I would also argue is that this is sort of an insane response. I mean, if, I, if someone is complaining about, you know, America, even if it's trivial, right, I mean, to say, oh, this is, you know, slavery, uh, you know, the government is, you know, making me do this and that, when other countries, you know, maybe it'll chop off your head. So when someone responds, you know, hey, you know, you lucky you don't live in some other country where, you know, you're not even allowed to speak against the government. You know, count your blessings. You know, my response to this is, okay, uh, we should, uh, okay, I'm going to poke you in the eye. And after I poke you in the eye and you say, what the hell, man, you should say to me, hey, be grateful. A lot of people... You know, would would poke Still out your stab eye. you? They would stab yeah, you. Yeah, like would a poke knife. out your eye. You're lucky. I'm just poking you in the eye. You owe me. You actually me, owe me money now. You owe me money now for, you know, all, for you know, not stabbing uh, and killing you. Yeah. You know, if if someone is gonna if someone says give me a hundred dollars or I'll shoot you, maybe we should say to them thank you. A lot of people would have stolen a thousand dollars from me. <laughs> thank you for only stealing a hundred. It's so grateful. Thank you. Maybe we should let out all these murderers in prison. The rapists, yep. Because they only killed one person or two, where there are people who killed thousands. So come on, be grateful. They're so much better. Let them out. Yeah, every murderer should be let go because of Charlie Manson, right? Charles Manson. Well, Charlie Manson didn't actually kill anyone, but I, um, you know, well, to me, he did uh, implicitly. So anyway, um, let, let's go. Let's go to the next topic. We're we're running out of time here, man. Uh, there was one more statement that was quote. This is a statist mentality, quote, the will of the people and acting in society's interest, unquote. Now, I want you to tell us what does that mean and the conflict well, in current government. First of all, there's no such, whenever you hear someone talk about, I mean, you heard this a lot during the government shutdown. There's, you know, the Republicans are trying to violate, go against the, the, the will of the people. Are they not part of the people? Right? Is is the people just your people and who you agree with? And any dissent is non-people or animals or something like that? Um, they're a part of the people uh, giving their voice and opinion. You might not like it. Mm -hmm. They might be a minority that you want to squash. But nevertheless, they are people. There's no such thing as the will of the people. There are numerous people with different conflicting wills. Uh, so to say that government represents the, you know, the will of the people uh, is isn't true, and there's also an inherent conflict in government because most uh, right politicians don't know who votes for them. There's a secret ballot; they don't know who votes for them, but they do know who gives them political campaign contributions, and they do know who lobbies for them. And a lot of money and a lot of resources have have been given to them to be able to be in office. So let's say there's a piece of legislation and it can either benefit the lobbyists who or the will of the general majority or, or the voters or whatever. A special interest group. Right. What do they do? Are, do they have an obligation to fulfill the will of the people they know helped them in office and who gave them political cam campaigns to do this? Sorry, I'm not going to help you. My goal is to help other people. So there is this conflict of interest, and either way, you know, either you're not being fair to the special interests, or you're not being fair to you know the voters. But who didn't ne make near as much of a sacrifice? Yeah, uh, it's, it's just a mob and a gang that's being you know, and and the conflict of interest is uh, th this special interest group is really the government. Not we are not part of the government. They are the government, and they have these. Uh, various incentives to do things outside of what you're being told they're going to do, right? I mean, they do have these other strings pulling their the different ways, and so that, that's very true. And I think in general, though, we have to point out the fact that the state itself, any collective system, it's not like when, when me and Rothschild and, and Dano and all the rest of us come together on Voluntary Virtues Radio on Tuesday nights, it's not like oh, we all are voluntary virtues, right? I mean, sure, we are in a mental construct, but we are still Daniel Rothschild. 
We are still. I, I, he is Rothschild. I am Mike Shanklin. There's Mike Dano. There's Cody Limbaugh. There, 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 there's individuals. Kyron. Yeah. I mean, Robert. I, I, I don't want to get anybody out, so I'm not going to say any more names. But anyway, there's there we're still individuals that make up the collective. Right? Only the individuals are real. We're the ones who are tangible and have our own consciousnesses and are not a part of the damn Borg and don't have a machine plugged into us like the Matrix. So we are real individuals. The collective is just – it's an illusion. It's a representation. It's a reference to something else that is made up of a bunch of individuals. So really, only the individual is real anyway. And once again, interest and society. Government is anti-society. Not only is government anti-society, but interests are subjective as well. So there's so many fallacies in this one statement. Yeah. It almost makes me want to right. and you know, And of course, government violates the will of the people because yeah. the word will – comes from willingly. Yep, exactly. I want to do it. Yeah. If I have to put a gun to your head to get you to do something, I am violating your will, even if it's justified. If someone wants to kill me and I defend myself, I violate the will of the person who wants to kill me. Now, it's justified to violate his will in that scenario, but I'm certainly violating his will. His will is he wants me dead. I don't want to be dead. I'm violating his will by defending myself. Right. Anytime there's a gun in the room, whether used in self-defense, whether used not in self-defense, someone... A, someone's will is being violated. If I go to a girl and I say have sex with me or else, the only way I know if she wants to have sex with me is if I say, hey, you want to have sex? And she says, sure. But if I have to force her to have sex, she doesn't want to have sex with me. <laughs> okay? If the if government truly reflected the will of the people, there would be no consequences. The government wouldn't force the people to do anything. She should simply... be she should be lucky you only raped her once. There's people who rape twice and three times, Rothschild. I know, I know. I know. <laughs> she should count her blessings. All uh, right, man. No, good stuff. Anything else you want to add before we go? No, that's it. All right, good stuff. Thank you so much, Daniel. Great stuff. I'm, I'm so glad we had these conversations at least once a week, and hopefully we'll have them more often. I'm yeah, trying. You know, I'm a busy guy over here. I got a lot of stuff going on, especially. I know you're you, you're using the kid excuse, but it's all right. Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> he, he is a bit quite a handful, but he's so awesome. I know. Man. I know. We went out to you last time. Anyway, I'll talk to you off air. Thank you, everyone else, for checking out Voluntary Virtues. As you guys know, I have videos coming out hopefully every other day at least going forward, as well as Tuesday night we have a radio show, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And check out the Facebook page, Statism is Slavery. We have 180,000 subscribers and growing hundreds a day. I'm talking every five minutes we got a new subscriber coming in. And I wake up in the morning, we go up at least 100, 150. It is invigorating. I'm telling you. It's so powerful and I love where we're going with this. So thank you everyone for all the support. Send all your friends over there. Keep sending them up. Let's get it to a million people and get us on CNN and Fox and tear apart some O'Reilly and Michael Moores and all the rest of these fools. And we'll, we'll represent you pretty well. Guys, thank you once again for checking out Voluntary Virtues. I will see you soon. Have a great day slash afternoon slash evening slash whenever you're watching this. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.